since the split, has your ex gotten in touch with you? The question was asked by a woman who was drinking wine on the Travelers in Terrace. Brooke turned her head away. Not since I threw him out and gave him divorce papers and an order to stay away from me. He tried to get in touch with the kids, but they didn't answer. Ellie, who was new to the group, asked, was it hard to split up? It sounds really painful. Brooke responded with anger, it happened a year ago. It took him a year to figure out that the kids didn't want anything to do with him. He finally gave up, signed the papers, and left. He hasn't been seen in two years. Get rid of it. Why did you split up with him? She asked Ellie. A voice spoke from behind me. It was because he cheated on me with Gemma Evans, his first love. Jake Van Dam lied. Not at all, he's not that hard to understand. I would remember if he cheated on me. Brooke Puckett, you're back to your tricks. Brooke flinched. You're nervous, because look who's here. Gemma replied. While we were together, you started to play with Jake. You lied to get us back together, and now you say he cheated on me. What time is this said to have happened? She asked Gemma. You know that happened two years ago, Brooke said. I was learning languages in Scotland at the time, so please bear with me. I haven't been here in three years. I taught high school on the other side of the country before that. Brooke turned pale. She wasn't ready for this, and it was bad news. Who else did Jake cheat on Brooke with if not Gemma? Gemma made her point. He could no longer stay here because of what you did. You played tricks on everyone, even his parents. He wasn't fooled, I think. He was just following you. Are those his kids? Gemma thought out loud. But I need to go see people, like Jake's parents. Brooke's face was barely colored. Do not dare, I will make your life awful. Gemma smiled in a cold way. You haven't had a good life, have you? To look good, you need a lot of makeup. But I need to visit your ex-in-laws and give Jake a good reason not to be there. Goodbye. Gemma added with one last look. I'm going to clear the air, Jake didn't cheat. Thanks for getting rid of him. He'll be mine soon enough. And your threat? Stupid. I'm leaving this pit of snakes tomorrow. Go suck some lemons now. Gemma got in her car and drove right to the Van Dam house. Gemma remembered the big house having three parking spots by the gate. It looked the same. Two huge ginkgo biloba trees were outside. Jake's great-grandparents had planted them. Gemma got her laptop out of the trunk, knocked on the door, and then waited. Jake's grandfather spoke up. Could I help you, girl? Mr. Van Dam, happy afternoon. Don't forget who I am, I'm Gemma Evans. Yes, I remember. Haven't you anything to do with Jake's marriage problems? Yes, sir. I'm here to show that Jake couldn't have been seeing someone else. At the time, I was in Edinburgh. The old man looked closely at Gemma, his eyes going right through her. He finally said, call me Rufus Sr., and his eyes lit up. Do I agree with my son and daughter-in-law that Jake is guilty? No, he's not able to. Why do you want to clear his name? Rufus Sr. could smell a lie, and Gemma knew that telling him a lie would be embarrassing. Jake doesn't know it yet, but I'm going to be the next Mrs. Van Dam, she told him straight out. But first I need to find him. Mr. Van Dam, do you know where he is? When he spoke, the old man's eyes sparkled. He lives at St. Christopher's Crossing and is doing well in school. Remember our secret, though, and I must say, you're a beautiful woman. Gemma told them, I have another secret. He and I will soon meet again, because I took a job at the same university. A voice from behind the house cut him off, but the old man just smiled. Where is the kitchen? Gemma nodded, and she almost ran into Jake's mom. She yelled, you've got nerve. Mess up my son's marriage and then show up here without being invited? His voice was loud as Jake's grandfather told him to get out. And, she's my guest, so I'll pay attention to what she has to say. She says she wasn't in the country during the whole thing. 
Anna Van Dam felt down and looked at Gemma with doubt. She shot back, I don't believe you. She smiled at the old man, took out her laptop, and said, I'll prove it. After an hour, Gemma saw her angry mother and grandpa. What now? She whispered. Gemma turned to being honest again. I'm going tomorrow, so I don't know. Before Brooke came along, Jake and I were quickly becoming friends. She told Brooke how she had lost her best friend and partner, but she didn't say that she thought Brooke was pregnant. Jake told her that story if she could find him. Anna was shocked by what the mother of her grandkids was up to, so she told her husband Jake Jr. to meet Gemma too. Dear, she asked with a smile, would you stay for dinner? Also, please tell my husband Randall your story. When asked, Gemma kindly said no, saying she needed to get ready for her new job. She also didn't tell Anna where her new job was. And took a quick glance away as Gemma said goodbye. Gemma, please let us know when you find Jake. We messed up and treated him badly. Anna said in a soft voice, I want my youngest back. I'll send the message to him if or when I find him. I'm not going to tell you where he is, though. Gemma added, Jake ran away for a reason, he doesn't want to be found. She then walked to her car. She saw a man coming up behind her as she walked. She thought, damn, Jake's brother. She checked him out. He looked older and heavier, and he walked like an ape, with rough features, a thick neck, and broad shoulders. He wheezed like a steam engine, and his stomach stuck out. Rufus Van Dam looked closely at the thin woman and felt like he knew her but couldn't put her in a specific place. He thought, she needs bigger breasts, but not my type. Those legs. As he walked into the house, he saw his grandfather. Have a guest? He asked. The look on Rufus Sintra's face stayed neutral. Yes, Jake's old friend is trying to get back in touch. We don't know where he lives, though. Young Rufus cursed in his head as he thought about his brother cheating on him. He told them, make sure it's complete. I still want him gone far away in every way, as he climbed the stairs to his accident-proof flat. Brooke thought about her life while the breakup was going on. Jake, who was 35, was younger by two years. Their kids were born a year apart and are now 16 and 15 years old. They didn't meet right away. Brooke saw Jake for the first time after he finished a 10-kilometer swim. At first, she didn't pay attention to him until a girl with dark hair helped him with his wetsuit. All of a sudden, he looked beautiful, and Brooke paid close attention to them. His hair was short and reddish-brown. He had green eyes and an oval face with a clear nose and big lips. He had long arms, wide hands, broad shoulders, and thin fingers. His swimmer's body was finished off by his strong legs. As she dried him off, the girl noticed that his muscles were tight. She later found out that he was a swimmer. Brooke decided she wanted him and made plans to get him, even though the girl was probably his girlfriend. It took him six months to get over being shy. When the girl he was interested in moving away, Brooke found it easy to control the situation. Jake suggested a barbecue for the whole family and told them he was the youngest of three children. Brooke watched Jake and his brother at the grill. They looked alike, but were very different. Jake wasn't too fat and didn't have a lot of muscles. His brother Rufus, on the other hand, was bigger, had bigger muscles, and was louder. Rufus liked Brooke and showed it by giving her gifts and attention. He finally helped her find a hotel room. Brooke found out she missed her period after a month. Rufus laughed in her face when she told him what she thought. He finally spat, dumb cow, you should have taken the pill. Only Brooke's first boyfriend and Rufus were in her dating past. After dealing with Rufus, she felt comfortable with Jake. After three months, they got married in a small wedding. Brooke has been happy since then. Jake paid attention and did a good job. On top of that, she had a lover for quick, relaxed dates. Rufus wasn't interesting, and his appearance was short. There were times when Brooke didn't want to finish. She loved how exciting it was to lie. Thirteen years later, Rufus' bad habits caught up with him and caused him a lot of trouble. 
His heart had been hurting for years from using drugs to build strength. When he passed out at the gym, he was lucky to have a nurse nearby who did CPR until the ambulance came. When Tess got to the hospital, she had a ruptured heart from using steroids for a long time, which meant she needed surgery right away. When Rufus got out of the hospital, his body had changed, and he knew he needed long-term care. Over the course of several months, he used Brooke against Jake by criticizing him and telling her to expect more financial security. Playing the victim, Rufus inflated how badly he was hurt, which slowly changed the way Brooke treated Jake in a bad way. She started to pick at things and demand her own car. She didn't realize how much stress she was putting on Jake, a level of stress she had never put on him before. Brooke lost her balance when Jake left in the middle of the rant, leaving her to yell after him. He went back to his office to show that he had had enough. After being married for almost 15 years, Brooke learned Jake took hits until he was pushed too far and then blew up. Jake saw his breaking point and knew he had to protect himself because of the deep hole in his soul. Jake had always known that Rufus would take over the family business, which was a successful supplier to the aircraft industry. Even though he had a PhD in aeronautics and a master's degree in industrial design, his father didn't let him do much. Jake focused on his own work because he knew he had a lot to do and thought Rufus was involved. Jake wouldn't sign a paper that would have kept him out of the race after his father fired him for a small mistake. He left, laughed at his dad, kissed his secretary, and felt free as he sang Tommy by The Who. Soon after that, a competitor offered him a good job with better benefits and the same pay as his old job. Jake knew that his family would want to push him to the side, so he did what his grandfather told him to do and started his own business in Luxembourg. He used this business to handle independent work, and most of the money he made was kept in accounts in other countries. While Brooke didn't know about Jake's business deals overseas, she thought he was working extra hours to make extra money. Jake put family time first, so he moved all of his money to accounts in other countries so he could keep freelancing without stopping. He decided to spend more time with his kids and cut down on his long work hours because he knew he needed to find balance. The next morning, Jake drank coffee and read the paper on his tablet as Brooke walked into the kitchen. Where were you all night? She said, I've been waiting for about five minutes. He replied, then you fell asleep. She responded in a dry way, cynicism doesn't suit you. Brooke bit back her mean response and instead told her, say what you think. Jake told Brooke he would work less hours so he could spend more time with their kids because he didn't like how demanding she was being. You know what she should do? Get a job. He told her he would divorce her if she didn't change, and he left for breakfast. Brooke was shocked because she had never seen Jake act this way before. Rufus told her he had a backup plan for dealing with Jake's stubbornness when she called him for help. Jake was sitting at his desk when his secretary told him that he had an unexpected guest. He was surprised and asked if there were any meetings that weren't on the list. The answer was, no, sir, but she insists it's urgent. An old woman came in and asked to see his ID before giving him two sealed papers that said, you have been served. She left and told the clerk that she was worried. Even though Jake knew it was bad news, he felt a strange sense of relief. He knew it was going to happen, but it still hurt, especially because of the restraining order that kept him from seeing his family and the statement that said he was seeing Gemma Evans. He started the steps that needed to be taken by getting legal help from a client recommendation and renting a small apartment for the short term. Let's go back to now. Brooke heard Olivia and Brian talking about something. Not too quiet that Brooke couldn't hear what they were saying, but just loud enough. That made it sound like her son was having a problem and wanted to talk to his dad about it. If you're having trouble, Brooke asked, why don't you talk to your Uncle Rufus about it? Olivia responded with a sneer. What does that fat, dirty pervert have to say that even remotely sounds like something a reasonable person would say? Brooke was shocked and hurt by proxy. She didn't want to tell them who the real father was, so she bit her tongue. Do you mind that he's your uncle? Okay, not a bad uncle. Gave me money to show my breasts and told me he would reward me greatly if I helped him satisfy his lust. 
And that's not what he asked for, her daughter said in a rude way. Brooke thought, gosh, that's his own daughter, and he knows it. God help me if what she says is true. That night, a lot of bodies were taken out of the closet. Brooke had no choice but to believe Rufus was a s asterisk x y jerk who could hurt her and her kids. None of the bad things that happened happened because Jake had given the kids confidence. The big problem now was that she would soon have to count on Rufus for money and a way of life. At first, Jake's large child support payments gave Brooke security, but she soon had money problems and felt bad about choices she had made in the past. As they talked, Gemma met Professor Leonard Daltrey, who told her interesting things about the university and his own life. He talked about temporary housing possibilities and suggested looking at homes in St. Christopher's Woods. Nadia Thompson joined Gemma in her search for a stable home after she got used to the area. They came across a sign that said land was for sale. In smaller text below, you can see that the land already had a building permit. Gemma exclaimed, what a beautiful place. I could see myself living here for sure. But no one would even think to build a house that would fit in with this surroundings. Nadia made a face. I know just the guy. He is an aeronautical engineer and creator, and we're getting to know him better and better. He tends to keep to himself, but when he does, he's great to be around. On Friday, I'll be having him over for dinner. If you'd like, you can meet him. Gemma happily responded, I'd love to. At the Van Damme house, Brooke's grandfather heard her thin voice calling out. Rufus Van Damme Sr. looked at the woman sitting at his desk. She was the mother of his great-grandchildren. He said, born to the wrong man. As a sensitive watcher of feelings, he noticed that she was upset. What's bad about you, sweetheart? It was asked. Do you know where Jake is? Brooke asked without being sure. Rufus answered, I won't say yes or no to that. Why do you ask? Having trouble in paradise? Brooke was taken off guard and almost said yes, but she stopped herself in time. The old man saw how she was reacting. It was time to face the problem head on. He continued in a stern voice. There are some pretty bad things about Rufus. Would you agree? I waited for Brooke. His need for steroids doesn't help at all. She responded, I'm not sure what you mean. He smiled, Rufus Sr. young woman, don't try to trick me. Even though I'm old, I'm not crazy. I know that your kids don't get Jake's traits. What? Why do you dare? Brooke screamed. Don't undervalue me, D. I'm ready to risk all of my money. What color are your eyes? Blue. And Jake's? Green. And those of your kids? Brown. There you have it. Since Rufus and Jake used to look alike, it's very unlikely that they look like Jake. But Rufus has brown eyes, and you spend a lot of time with him. Brooke's world fell apart. She tried to speak, but couldn't because she was holding on to the chair back so hard that her fingers turned white. The things Grandpa said would not change. You are the only one who feels this way. You let the wrong man control you and your kids because you gave in to his charms. Now that something unexpected has happened, you want Jake to come back. I won't help you if I don't know where he is. Leave. As Brooke left, Rufus Sr. lingered by the window, thinking about how long a message he needed to write. Even though Gemma became friendly with the Thompsons while she was there, they had never asked her into their home until now. While she waited for the door to open, she nervously looked around. When Nathan said hello, she was shocked. Hi, I think your name is Gemma. My name is Nathan. Everyone calls me Nathan except Nadia when she's mad. Nathaniel comes next. Welcome inside. Gemma was shocked to see a scar on Nathan's beautiful face. As he led her to the kitchen, she noticed how slim he was, though he walked a little funny. What was the cause of his wound? Gemma was made to feel welcome in the kitchen. After saying hello to their son Jacob, she turned to Nadia and said nice things about how beautiful the house and its surroundings were. Nadia's face briefly shook as she thought about what to say. 
There is a bright side to this long, sad story. I'll tell you about it someday, but Nathan's story requires his approval. Not many people know about it. For now, I can say that Nathan took it back from the locals who were abusing it and won. And I don't own Jacob. He's Nathan's son from his first marriage. His first wife died? He does have a widower. And I'm happy to say that there will be more kids here after six months. Gemma gave Nadia a hug to show how happy she was. Nathan cut her off when she was about to ask when the baby was coming. Hey, Gemma. Meet Jake. Gemma yelled and gave Jake a quick hug. When he greeted her, he didn't seem to care. To Gemma, it's been a long time. Gemma let him go, because she felt bad about it. Nathan asked Nadia, do you two know each other, after they looked at each other? Jake spoke up before Gemma could answer, we used to be friends. Gemma's happiness went away, and tears started to form in her eyes. It wasn't the happy meeting she had hoped for. Jake, why are you so far away, she cried. Aren't you glad I'm here? I really missed you. Jake was shocked and even more confused. Nathan looked at his hosts and said, let's give you some space. That's where you can study. Jake sat in the study and watched Gemma, who was clearly upset. You told Brooke that we had an affair while I was married to her, he told her. To end my marriage, you even signed the document. Why should I be happy to see you? I felt very badly about those lies. Gemma suddenly understood how big the lie was. She didn't like how Brooke had used her to hurt Jake's reputation in their town. Gemma spoke to Jake with determination, pay close attention. I lived in Europe for three years before coming here. That's not what I told Brooke. I heard her bragging about it in public, so I talked to her about it right then. I talked to your parents and grandpa later. He told me that you were okay and that I might see you here. I didn't think it would happen so quickly, but I was already planning to look for you. Jake blushed and said, I've missed you so much. In spite of this, the statement is fake. And someone is in trouble if you still have the first one. I loved you back then, and I still do. I would never cheat on you by dating someone else while you were married. I've been going crazy because I think you betrayed me, and I don't know what I did to earn it. Do you really believe me? Of course. You told me at least one fact that I can check, and I can get the rest from calling my grandfather. Also, you've never lied to me before. I do believe you. Gemma was glad to have gotten over that problem. The next problem was how to tell Jake how she felt and whether he would feel the same way. With all her strength, she asked, can we make things right with a kiss? She moved her chair back and walked up to Jake. He hugged her and asked, can you forgive me? Why? Gemma replied with anger. In a terrible way, you've been misled. You can't forgive anything. She turned around as Jake leaned in to kiss her on the cheek, and their lips met. When Gemma broke the kiss, she smiled big, which shocked Jake. Did you just kiss me? What really happened? Jake was shocked and asked. Yes, I've wanted to since you broke up with that woman. I already claimed you for Brooke. Just tell me when. I can't wait, but I'm coming for you whether it's slow or fast. Jake was enjoying the feel of Gemma's body against his, but he told her, you know I'm hurt, right? There is a reason I chose to build my house so far away. I have to heal first, and I haven't faced my fears, because it hurts too much. Let me in. I'll always be there for you. I know you married her because she was expecting. You would be with me if not. Also, I've been wondering if your son is really yours. That doesn't make sense. Let's now join our friends. Finally, think about taking Professor Daltrey's job offer. Gemma told you that it might be good for you. When they got back, Gemma said, problem solved. His mind isn't fully convinced yet, but he's mine now. Nadia was very happy. That was quick and good. What will happen next? Gemma sat next to Jake and answered with great happiness. I have plans. One has to do with fairness. 
One is about keeping him close to me all the time. Last but not least, how do I get that land we saw this afternoon? The dinner was a hit, and people laughed and talked about old times. Gemma told old stories about when they were friends. In the end, she brought up an important subject. Jake, has that woman ever told you how she had a fully grown son after only six and a half months of pregnancy? I wasn't aware, because I was too focused on the present. That was a stupid thing for me to do now. What do you mean by that, though? Nathan spoke softly, because he understood how difficult it was to watch a baby be born. It could not be yours, and you could have been tricked. But it's clear that they look a lot like me and each other. Jake and Gemma both paused, not wanting to say what they thought is going on. All of a sudden, the two women hugged Jake and spoke words of comfort. Jake asked, What do we do now, after he calmed down? I need to be sure. Nadia took his hand and asked, Can you think of someone who looks like you? Maybe a cousin? Gemma spoke up and said, Rufus, it could be him. Jake replied, No, they don't get along. Nadia suggested that they might not tell you because they knew you wouldn't figure it out. A DNA test is the only way to be sure D. We need a very good lawyer for this. The best person is Donna Marshall. Could you get in touch with her, Nathan? Brooke, meanwhile, was still having a hard time. She was stuck for two weeks after Jake's grandpa refused to help her find him. Rufus was important to her financially, so she didn't want to cut ties with her kids. She was making dinner while the kids did their schoolwork when someone knocked on the door. A man and a woman were outside, which she saw through the small window. She opened the door and asked, Can I help you? The woman said, Are you Mrs. Puckett? Mrs. Brooke Puckett, who used to be married to Mr. Jacob Randall Van Dam. Yes, what's wrong? The man then said, I have a warrant. We need pieces of DNA from your kids. You will be arrested if you don't follow the rules. What? Who? Why do you need their DNA to find out who the father is? The woman's easy confirmation shocked Brooke. There was always a small part of Brooke that thought Jake might be able to make up with her kids. Jake also paid her a lot of child support, which kept her nice and cozy. If the kids weren't his, those payments would stop, putting her way of life at risk. At the same time, another pair of rescuers and an officer arrived at the Van Dam house. As Rufus Sr. watched, he was afraid that Gemma had found Jake and told him the truth. Rufus Jr. fought back, which led to an embarrassing arrest. After two weeks, Gemma snuck into Jake's apartment and showed him the findings. Both of them sat on the couch and watched as Jake read the paper, clearly upset. Jake, what's wrong? Gwen said, you look pale. Even though I'm not, I feel like I'm having a heart attack. Both of the kids are jerks. They and Brooke are going to pay me back for everything they did to me. Gemma put her arm around Jake and asked him to comfort her. Even though being with her made him feel better, Jake was still hesitant to respond. Even though they hugged and kissed each other on the cheeks, Gemma was really wanting to be with him. Jake's look then softened, showing that he was vulnerable. He started by saying, Gemma, please understand. I love you very much, but I need to make things right first. I don't want to get you involved. Plus, starting now could make you bounce back, which isn't fair. I'll understand if you want to leave. Gemma felt calm and happy. She knew it was hard for Jake to show such strong feelings, but she could tell he loved her. After taking a moment to think about this, Gemma gave him a soft kiss and poured her love into the hug. Jake was shocked and had a lot of feelings. Jake, don't make any more excuses, Gemma told him. I will be here for you every step of the way. Jake hugged Gemma and enjoyed the smell of her. He then offered, why don't we put off building the house until we figure this out? Then you might not need it. I could fix up and add on to my house to make it work for you. Gemma was shocked. Did he just ask me to live with him? She asked out loud. Jake said that it was, in fact, an offer. No matter what the right is, I'm fully committed to you. I'm all for getting you a ring, though. Gemma said, I do want a ring. 
I want a simple gold band like yours. When you're ready, I'll bring the broom. In the same week, they met with Donna Marshall and Jake told her about his plan to get even. Donna said she wasn't up to the job, but she knew someone who was, a co-worker who had experience with similar tasks. After the DNA tests, Brooke did her jobs and dared to hope that the silence would mean that the ordeal would go away. With the help of her grandpa, she was able to keep Rufus from having a direct effect on her children. He seemed scared of Rufus Sr. after Rufus Jr. was arrested. A loud knock on the door broke her peace all of a sudden. She opened it and saw Rufus standing there with a stack of papers in his hand. His face was red and his body was shaking. What is this? He yelled and waved the papers around. That jerk of a brother wants a lot of money from me to raise my kids. Brooke grumbled as she fell into a chair, he's even taken all my things. Jake is now out and about and knows what's really going on with the kids. He is getting ready to get even. It's over if he goes after me too. It would be worse for me than for Edmund Dante. As her luxurious life fell apart, fear filled her. When the doorbell rang again, Rufus Jr. was still yelling. Brooke wasn't sure what to do, but the knocking kept happening. She calmed down and went up to the door. When she opened it, she saw a guy with round glasses and a mustache who looked a lot like Professor Calculus from Tintin. Behind him, a woman with a camera was ready. He asked, Are you Mrs. Brooke Puckett? She got a package that confirmed who she was. You have been served. Before leaving, he said, Have a good day. Brooke watched them leave with a heavy heart and then ran inside, filled with fear and dread. When Brooke opened the package and looked inside, she saw a bunch of papers that made her even more worried. DNA test results proved beyond a doubt that Jake was not the father of the children, his brother was named as their actual father. Later papers detailed a wide range of claims, such as claims for child support payments to be refunded with interest, as well as claims of lying and slander, the latter coming from Gemma Evans. Reassurance from Rufus brought Brooke comfort. He told her that the company would pay for the court fees because she was the mother of his children. Despite this, the move didn't do much to ease the tension, especially as the night went on. At a later family gathering, Rufus Jr. boldly announced that he and Brooke were now romantically involved and that he planned to take custody of the children after the court case was over. Grandfather Rufus stepped in and pushed for his grandson to get a lawyer. He also asked that the company not get involved in the claimed deception and its effects, stressing the need for personal responsibility. There was a tense silence before Jake's father spoke up. He pushed for legal action against what he saw as abuse, citing the company's legal expertise. The conversation that followed showed how complicated the legal and social situations were, a sign of the many problems that lie ahead. Rufus Sr. responded by saying that Jake was right and that the children were indeed Rufus's because he was having an affair with Brooke. Given the DNA proof, he stressed Jake's right to go to court. He also mentioned the company's policy violations caused by Rufus Jr.'s mistakes, suggesting that court action would protect company rules rather than boost Rufus Jr.'s ego. When Rufus Jr. got angry, he stormed out, clearly shaking. When Rufus Sr. saw how badly his youngest son was acting, he followed him and gave him a warning that was full of poison. Even though there was a fight, Rufus Jr. stood firm in his power and connections, refusing to let anyone stop him. When Rufus Sr. got back to his apartment, he thought about what had happened and then took action by pulling out his phone book to call the University of St. Christopher's Crossing. Rufus Sr. is under pressure from his boys to use the company's legal advisors in their fight against Jake during breakfast. Even though Rufus Sr. knew that the court dispute was expensive and that there was a plan to drag it out, he stayed firm and warned against any misuse of company resources. Later, Rufus Sr. called Professor Daltrey and asked for a favor for two people. He thought about the help he had received in the past and offered to return the favor by trying to hire Jake Van Dam and Gemma Evans. Leon said, Ah, I get your grandson, but Miss Evans. Since Jake is no longer married, she told me she had heard stories about his marriage and wanted to clear things up. It looks like they've already met. There was no mistake, Rufus Sr. said. 
When would you like to meet? I will make sure that they are available. How long is the drive? I can leave in 30 minutes. I'd like you to be there. I'll make it happen. And Rufus Sr. answered, You look eager. He just said, Yes. I'll see you soon. Leon was shocked when Rufus Sr. showed up later that same day. His voice was strong, even though he was weak, and his eyes still sparkled. It got heated between the older men before he let Jake and Gemma into his office. There was a table with Leon, Gemma, Jake, and Rufus Sr. in Leon's office. When Jake and his grandpa saw each other again, they were both sad about the time they had lost and happy to be together again. Rufus Sr. didn't waste any time. Jake, would you think about running the business? Jake asked in surprise. But Grandpa, why? What about Mom and Dad? Rufus smiled in a sad way. I'm sick, and it's getting worse. I might not be able to deal with this bad pair that is causing trouble at work right now. I have seen personally how you lead. Jake grabbed Gemma's hand and looked shocked. I don't know what to do. Why not tell me this? Hey Jake, I had a reason. But could you answer my question? What about your girlfriend? Grandpa, I'm building a house here for us, though. Gemma added a funny comment. What does taking it slow mean now? She gave Jake a quick look that suggested she agreed. Jake said, I want kids soon. Gemma jumped up, gave Jake an intense kiss, and said, I stopped taking my pills last night. Is that clear? Rufus spoke up and reminded them that they were still at work. And Jake? It's not far to the office. Jake and Gemma looked at each other and agreed to Rufus's offer without saying a word. Jake looked at his dad. What about mom and dad? Let me handle that. They won't be a threat when you're in charge. You're not the only one who is mad at them. When should I take over? You're taking charge, right? How do I lead the company that makes me happy? I agree with you, Grandpa. But I'll need end-of-life care as my health gets worse. Leon helped open a private clinic for this reason after seeing his wife die in a painful way. In ten days, I plan to go there. Jake thought about this in silence until Gemma asked, What's with all the secrecy? I think Randall and Rufus will do anything to keep living the way they do. Jake is already a pain for Rufus and I had to tell him not to file cases at the company's law office. Leon stepped in and said, We've come up with a plan to keep you safe from both Randall and Rufus. He asked his old friend, Should I explain, or would you like to? Go ahead, I'm tired, Rufus Sr. Leon answered. He then laid out the plan. When Rufus dies, trusted managers will be told to use special software to lock down the company. Employees will be sent home for the day with full pay. Everything has been found. Both Jake and Gemma were shocked by how bad things were. Jake asked what their job was. His grandfather told them they'd be told when the will was made public, which meant they could take over the business. Rufus Sr. told Jake that Randall and Rufus were taken care of and that he would write an explanation. He told Jake not to tell anyone yet. Grandpa, can I come see you at the clinic? Asked Jake in a sad way. Son, no. For what's to come, I'd rather be alone. He answered, promise to take care of your mother. They said their goodbyes with tears in their eyes, and left. They talked about the news back at Jake's place. Jake sighed. I'll miss him more than my own father, he said. Gemma could only give a hug and a kiss to make her feel better. Two weeks later, Jake, eager to finish building his home in the woods, stopped his talks with a contractor Nathan had suggested. He decided to stay and added on to the house, making it a modern five-bedroom home with a geothermal heating system and green energy sources. Jake was sitting outside his house when he got some bad news. Gemma's arrival brought him some relief, but he still felt like he had lost something. The following day, Jake went to the will reading with Gemma. Jake had to stop in a mall parking lot because a black car was following them. As another car pulled up, a woman got out and said she was from the FBI. She was in charge of keeping Jake safe until the problem was fixed, 
as Rufus Sr. had asked. Gemma stayed in the waiting area while Jake went into the meeting room. He saw his father, mother, and Rufus Jr. already sitting down. Rufus Jr. made fun of him, but the lawyer stepped in quickly and told Rufus to behave or else he would be removed. Randall didn't get in the way because he respected the lawyer's power. Jake couldn't get the image of Gandalf out of his thoughts as the formalities began. He was shocked when he was told he was the only one who could take over as head of Van Damme Aeronautical Industries. Jake wasn't sure what to think about the quick change of events. While Randall and Rufus got angry, Jake's mother stayed calm in her seat with a small smile on her face. I'm his son and Rufus is mine. Fraud, I'll tear you apart. Randall yelled at the lawyer. The lawyer stood his ground and carefully pressed a button. Within seconds, the door swung open, and four big guys walked in. They stood next to the angry two and gave off an aura of strength that could match a gorilla's. They all growled at Randall. Sir, you wouldn't want me to get physical, would you? Randall lost confidence right away, but Rufus, who was known for not being able to hold back, charged at Jake and yelled, I'll kill you, you illegitimate. In an instant, he was back in his seat, pulling on his thumb and wrist in pain. Once things were back to normal, the lawyer continued. Friends, Rufus knew that this bad thing was going to happen. So, I asked these men to keep things in order. He then turned to Randall and went on. There is proof that you are not Mr. Van Damme's actual son that he has. In a good reason, he split up with your mom. Because of this, Rufus Jr. is not his grandson. After making sure his word got through, the lawyer kept going and spoke to Randall. In addition, Mr. Van Dam found out that you abused your wife and used business money for your own pleasure. He asked your wife to marry him, and she said yes. She had a child named Jacob Randall Van Dam. We have genetic evidence and notarized documents that prove Jacob Randall Van Dam is the real second son of Anna Van Dam Hansen and Rufus Van Dam. Randall looked like he was about to blow up and when he did, he threw his anger at his wife. You're not faithful. You have lied to me. Do you think you can get away with it? I am going to sell you to a Russian brothel. He screamed. The lawyer stepped in and told two guys to hold Randall down. At the same time, Rufus looked like he was shocked, like a fish out of water. The lawyer spoke to the men in a very good way. Please write down this behavior and the threats that Randall made. As for you, Randall, you can lie about it all you want. The money you and your son stole is clear from the proof we have. You stole about six million dollars from the company to support your lavish lifestyle. That's not counting the money you kept in the Cayman Islands. You've also sold sensitive technology to bad countries and rivals without permission. The IRS and the FBI among other government bodies responsible for national security, want to talk to you both about this. You will help them with their investigation whether you want to or not. He then turned to the four men who were holding Randall and Rufus and asked, Would you please lead these men outside and give them to the police? Brooke, on the other hand, waited outside with Gemma to watch Jake come in. Brooke felt a wave of relief when she saw Gemma keep her word and Jake's grateful hug but her happiness changed to sadness 30 minutes later when she saw Rufus and his father being let out, checked to make sure they were who they said they were, and then driven away separately. What's going on? Brooke wondered as her mind raced with fear. Soon after, she went up to one of the guys who was with the father and son and gave them to the police. I'm afraid I can't give you more information, ma'am. The man said, all I can say is that they'll be helping the police with their investigation and it will take a while. Someone else said, it looks like they're wanted for fraud, theft, industrial espionage, and giving sensitive technology to countries that aren't supposed to have it. I don't think we'll see them for 20 years. Who will run Van Damme's company after they die? When Brooke asked, the pit in her stomach grew deeper. The answer came from the other guy, the one who walked in with the informant. Right away, Brooke felt like she wasn't linked to reality. She wasn't aware of what was going on in the office, but it was clear that Jake had won. Rufus had told her she would have a luxurious life and not have to worry about Jake's case, but those promises were no longer there. 
She was upset, so she went to Rufus's unlocked car and found the key fob on the center dashboard. She drove home because she was so sad. After a month, Brooke was in a lot of trouble. Her small income wasn't enough to keep up the way of life she was used to in what she now called her past life. Now she had to come up with a way to either make more money or spend less. The kids' school fees were the most important thing. She thought that the only way out was for her to get Jake to take care of the kids, which meant she would have to pull him away from that woman again. She had gone to parties and drank too much while she was with Rufus. Rufus pushed her to get a lot of plastic surgery, which included a belly tuck to get rid of the extra fat that came after giving birth, breast augmentation and lift, facelift, and lip enhancement. That's why she lost her natural look, which was exactly what Jake liked about her. With skin that looked fake, she now looked like a less colorful version of the singer Cher. Brooke didn't care that she had changed how she looked, because she was sure she could easily substitute Gemma. Brooke sat in her car early one morning, ready to watch whoever came out of the house. She was going to leave and come back later if it was Jake. If it was Gemma, she would wait a few minutes to make sure she wouldn't come back, then go to the door to get her husband back. All of a sudden, a blue Nissan Rogue showed up and then vanished around the corner. Brooke quickly looked at her makeup and then waited five minutes before getting out of the car and walking toward the front door. She had heard that Jake had planned and built part of the house himself, so she made herself look at it carefully to find something good about it. He could always ask her to suggest renovation that fits his tastes. With its north-facing front, the house looked like it was part of the hill. Two big windows with shutters were on either side of the door. Brooke took a big breath, moved her shirt to show off her breasts, grabbed the doorknocker, and let it fall. Brooke calmly waited as the sound echoed through the house. A quiet door opened, and Jake came in just as she was about to leave. He looked at her without making any facial expressions and didn't invite her inside. She finally spoke in a seductive way. Hey, Jake. It looks good on you. I see that life is going well for you. Brooke, I've been waiting for your call for some reason. What do you need? Let's talk. Are you going to let me in? Jake sighed. He thought, let's just get this over with. Then come in, he said tiredly, walking her into his office, which was close to the door so she couldn't see the rest of the house. Jake had a vague idea of what she was up to. He sat down in the chair across from her and said, All right, Brooke. Talk. What do you need from me? Will you not show me the rest of the house? I don't see why I would. Tell me why you're here now. Jake, don't you see that we belong together? We have a past and two kids. You need to come back to me. While Jake looked at Brooke, he had a strange thought. What's going on? Is she going crazy? He said out loud, we do have the same past, but my version is very different from yours. If you think we'll get back together, you're de-crazy. Jake's answer didn't bother Brooke. I'm sorry I messed up, but we still have kids to think about. I can't give them what they need. They're not even mine. I'm sure they come from my half-brother, so why should I doubt them? You've been their main caretaker, and you've done a great job. Rufus has never been able to take good care of them. Jake sighed and said, Don't worry, I'll take care of them because their grandmother, my mother, asked me to. She begged me to make sure you couldn't get to that money. Brooke, I don't want to make your life better. Brooke wasn't ready for how this talk would go. Jake had always done what she asked, and she had easily forgotten the problems that led to their divorce. And now she ran into pushback. She tried a new approach, because she really wanted Jake to help her and her kids. Jake, she cooed, I know I've hurt you, but Rufus was the one who made you do it. We can both benefit from being without him now that he's gone. Think about what I could give you. You would be amazed at how good I am in bed. Leave that cold woman and come back to me. We could live a happy life together like a real family. Jake didn't say anything for a moment, which made Brooke think she had won him over. But what she said made him feel the opposite way. It looks like you're dressing and acting like a prostitute. 
The way we've talked in the past makes me wary of you. I will never touch you, even if you're dressed in a sexy way. Regarding your kids, I've set up housing for them in St. Christopher's Crossing. Olivia is going to college there, so Brian is going to live with his grandma until he starts college there too. You're not fit to handle his care or give him a place to live. That's taken care of. That being said, I won't be giving you any money. After a short pause, Jake's words shocked Brooke. He then said, if you don't give in, I'll tell the police that you're a fraudster and that you tried to blackmail me by saying that the kids aren't yours during the divorce. Leave now. Okay, I'm done. As Jake fell silent, Gemma walked through the door. Jake asked her in, which meant Brooke had to leave. Gemma walked into the room with a big smile on her face. Her baby bump was easy to see. She eagerly walked up to Jake and kissed him on the cheek while whispering carefully so Brooke wouldn't hear. What I thought was true. They come in twos. Brooke couldn't hold back her tears as Jake's smile grew bigger. She yelled, you're expecting, when she realized that Jake and her plans had gone wrong. Gemma and Jake looked at each other, and Jake gave a small nod. Gemma stated to Brooke, yes, I'm pregnant. I'm going to give Jake the children he's always wanted. We need to make plans now that you're going. Let's make changes to the kids' room. Brooke came to a sudden realization. You mean the kids? Gemma's face lit up. Sure, I'm having twins. I'm three months along. When my belly started to swell up early, I became suspicious. The first ultrasound didn't show both babies, because one was hidden by the other. This new scan showed that there are two boys. She kissed Jake fiercely and whispered, boys, but Brooke spoke out against it. This is not how you should leave me. Do not leave me to my own devices. Take your nephew and niece. Jake decided it was time to stop being polite, and he replied in a way that Brooke knew but Gemma hadn't heard before. I'm not sure what Olivia, Brian, and I have to do with each other. Tell me. Always keep in mind that Randall and I are not Rufus Sr.'s real children. For the past few months, Brooke hasn't talked to Randall or Rufus Jr., even though we share the same mother. Anna stayed away from her and didn't want anything to do with her. Brooke understood that she was really by herself. She lived in a rundown apartment and sold her things one by one because she didn't have a good job. She hung her head and didn't pay much attention to what Jake said next. I would leave you to your own devices if it were up to me. My mom and Gemma, on the other hand, thought that leaving you would break you totally. That's fine with me. But they're afraid that taking care of you will be too much for them. I found you a job, then. The work is easy and physical, and it will pay your rent and meet your other needs. Even though Brooke applied for many jobs, she was turned down every time. She would have to look for work somewhere else, maybe even far away, and she might lose touch with her kids forever. Jake gave her a business card with his number on it. Gemma also said, this is your only chance to stay in touch with the kids. That's the only job you can get. As soon as the court case is over, if you don't take advantage of this chance, we will not seek custody of your children with you anymore. They now know what you really did to the man they thought was their father. At this point, Gemma told Brooke it was time to leave. She stood by the door and spoke to Brooke, telling her, in the end, I won. I have Jake, and soon I'll have his kids. Your selfishness made Jake sick. And you bet on the wrong man to give you a false life of wealth. I have the best man, and you have nothing left. Gemma looked Brooke straight in the eye and said, let me warn you. I will step in if you try to do anything with Jake. If you try to control or turn your kids against him, or if you hurt Jake in any way, I'll keep after you until you're completely ruined. Do you understand? Brooke was shocked by Gemma's direct threats and aggression. Please answer. Do you understand what I'm saying? You've hurt Jake enough already, so stop right now. Can you understand what I mean? Brooke responded in a soft voice. Yes, I understand. I won't be talking to Jake directly, I'll only talk to him through you. Yes, go now. Brooke was broken. 
Just hours before, she had stood in front of the mirror with confidence. In the last forty-five minutes, her whole world had fallen apart. Brooke walked slowly to her car. On the inside, Gemma was snug in Jake's arms. Brooke sighed. Are you mine? We are finally back together after almost twenty years, despite Brooke and because of how stupid she was. After a moment, she got up and pulled Jake with her. We need to work on it. Work on it? Why? Jake did ask. Gemma laughed as she led him into the bedroom and said, for baby number three of course. 